Alan Gomes to our uh, interview today for the Chopra Wealth in our series on science and spirituality, conversations at the cutting edge of science and spirituality. Alan is a dear friend, colleague, and mentor in many ways, and is uh, has been uh, the founder, I think you're the founder, Leslie, of the Society for Consciousness Studies, if not you're a luminary anyway, uh, yes. and you've led this for many years. So what I'd like to start right now is actually just ask you, where are you right now? Well, I am in uh, uh, Cuenca, Ecuador. It's, Cuenca is a city of about half a million people, uh, over a mile high in the Andes. It's a beautiful little city uh, and a uh, wonderful place to live. So we were looking for somewhere to settle down. Uh, prices in the Bay Area were getting pretty steep and the politics in the States were getting uncomfortable. So here we are, we have a beautiful place and uh, cost of living is less than half of what it would be in California. There are many, many, what well, they're called expats here. Um, and it's a friendly city. People are very friendly. Yes, uh, yeah. actually I've been to um, Ecuador and of course the Galapagos from there. So I know it well, it's beautiful. I'm very envious of you right now. <laughs> So, uh, you know, for our audience, who's uh, pretty diverse, I would like to start uh, with just asking you about your career. You know, where did you go to school, college, how you got interested yeah. in what you're doing, a little bit of history and background, and yeah. how you ended up being where you are today. Well, it's a long story because I'm an old man. <laughs> By the way, how old are you? Uh, 78, just a few days ago. I'm 74. I don't think we're old at all. Spring uh, chicken. We have the wisdom <laughs> of aging and the biology of youth. Yes. Uh, people sometimes comment on how many publications I have. And I say, well, two publications a year and you've got a book yeah, over the years, you know. But you want me to tell my story a little bit? I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, well, I come from uh, Columbus, Ohio, very uninteresting place, actually, although my father was interesting and he belonged to uh, the Columbus Astronomical Society. Uh -huh. So every uh, few weeks we went to lectures at the observatory, uh, and made a telescope for ourselves, and uh, I think that's where I acquired my interest in science, actually. Uh, I went to Ohio State undergraduate school <clears throat> and uh, graduated in 1964. And I was getting very interested. Uh, well, I actually started out wanting to be a cosmologist like our friend Brian Swim. But you know, those folks do an awful lot of advanced mathematics. And uh, I, I wasn't really a mathematician, although I like mathematics. Uh, and I drifted more and more in, in, towards psychology and was reading Carl Jung, not really understanding anything, but looked good to me. And uh, humanistic psychology was just on the horizon. Abraham Maslow I had published this incredible book called The Psychology of Being. And if you read that book, you would get inspired. You see, yes. No way around it. In fact, I wrote Abraham Maslow and I said, uh, I'd like to come and study with you at Brandeis University. Uh, and he said, well, uh, gee, I'd love to have you, but looking at your spelling, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think you'll cut it here. You obviously have a spelling problem. In fact, he's right, I'm dyslexic. And uh, spelling was always a problem for me before spelling checkers. And this was very fortunate because I later learned that his students were treated like dirt at Brandeis. Really, I didn't know that. Oh yes, his colleagues there were all behaviorists and they just considered him the scum of the earth. And he was a hard guy to get along with too. We could talk about that, but Michael Murphy calls him a humanistic Nazi. Uh, he, he was a difficult guy. He said, you wanna to go to the University of Florida and study with uh, Sid Gerard. 
who was the second president of the Association of Humanistic Psychology. And I was fortunate. I ended up uh, at the University of Florida. Uh, I did some work with Sid Gerard there. Uh, I also met uh, uh, a, a scholar in the philosophy department called Thomas Hanna, Tom Hanna. Uh, he was an interesting guy. He was the one that got me started reading Bergson and things about consciousness. And uh, turns out Tom Hanna shortly afterward came to California, started an institute of somatic uh, bodily studies uh, just north of California. And um, that later morphed into partly into a Saybrook Graduate School. So he was one of my mentors, mentors, although unfortunately he died in a car accident fairly early. Mm -hmm. So did Sid Gerard, but uh, it was a good start for me. And uh, it was a long story after that, but once the story was over with, I ended up at the University of Georgia uh, in um, studying the ear uh, and the physiology of the ear in the psychology department. And uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time there in the biology department. I actually got a degree in neuropsychology, although, uh, could have just as been uh, well been in zoology because I did. I wanted to do individual cell recording. And uh, I built my own laboratory and recorded, believe it or not, uh, motor, uh, motor neuron patterns from a crayfish. <laughs> uh, and I built, a, I built a computer, it was analog digital. You remember there were analog computers in those days. Did the analysis on it and uh, I got my degree in that area. So after that, I most of my career has been in uh, liberal arts colleges as a teacher. Uh, the job, job market was uh, <clears throat> good for me because everybody could see that I really knew biology. I knew science. And uh, a lot of psychology departments in those days not only were looking for PhDs, uh, but they had nobody to teach perception. Uh, they didn't understand the ear, they didn't understand the eye, both topics that I love myself, didn't really understand the brain. So that was pretty much my career. I spent uh, the last uh, 20 years uh, before I came to California at the University of North Carolina in Asheville. Uh, it was a fairly elite liberal arts college in the mountains there, very nice place to teach. Uh, but most of my friends were collecting in California because while all of this was going on, I was sneaking off to San Francisco and was very excited about the um, human potentials movement. So that meshed well with my interest in humanistic psychology. So in a sense, I led two lives. I was a biologist, scientist on the one side, but on the other was a very interested in humanistic psychology human potentials. I started reading books about human potentials and they all seem to involve uh, meditation, <laughs> uh, spiritual practices. I remember there was one called The Master Game. And it was about, a lot of it was about practices that uh, Himalayan uh, uh, Tibetan yogis would practice. And so I started practicing, uh, I ended up practicing some of the meditations, especially Taoist meditation I was very interested in. And one day my wife, uh, previous wife actually said, well, you know, this stuff is really spiritual. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's right. This is not just human potentials. It's really spiritual. Um, so, so I drifted in that direction. I was, uh, I, I wanted to be a Taoist. And I'd been watching Kung Fu, of course, on TV, stoned all the time. And I figured that was a past lifetime for me. I must have been a Taoist priest somewhere. Uh, but it could, eventually, I thought, I, you know, I need a teacher. And teachers are hard to find, especially Taoist teachers in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s. Uh, actually, my practice for a number of years was uh, based on Sri Aurobindo. Sri Aurobindo, as you know, wrote in English, clear, crisp English, 
And uh, even though some of his books like Savitri and uh, so on are huge tomes to read, uh, there are three volumes that are still out of his letters. He had many students all over the world and he corresponded with them, uh, just writing letters and the letters are very clear and they're organized by different topics. Um, and you can practice integral yoga pretty well on your own if you have to. I mean, it has a lot in common with your uh, book in a way. I mean, it's a practice of silence, sustained silence and awareness. So uh, that was my practice for several years, but I eventually began to feel, you know, I really do need a teacher here somewhere. And I uh, ended up uh, in the early 70s going to the Himalayan Institute, the one of their, uh, you know, they're up there. Swami Rama founded it and it was. Uh, Pennsylvania. What's that? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah, it was in the Adirondacks and it was an old Catholic uh, monastery or something, but uh, the Himalayan, his people had founded it. He, he, there's a long story about Swami Rama we should talk about too, but uh, he, he started out in Chicago. Well, he started out at, uh, with Elmer Green at the Minneker Foundation. Uh, and after he spent a couple, three years there doing uh, research with him, he uh, opened an office in a uh, hotel, motel in Chicago. And on the door, he wrote Swami Rama inquire within mm -hmm. and uh, anyway so this was the Himalayan Institute and I went there uh, with my wife on what they call a meditation weekend where you would just go and have silence and I mean I wasn't even thinking about Swami Rama himself who I thought was in India uh, but when I pulled in the drive there he stood right right beside the car opened the door and extended his hand he said finally you've come <laughs> so he was my teacher for a number of years I was you know not one of the close close acolytes that you know took over his work later or anything like that but went to many workshops um, over the years and uh, I think I should have appreciated him more really uh, because so many things he taught, I assume, were part of that tradition. And then after he left, I realized, no, no, there was just him. Nobody else was doing it. But uh, it was a good experience, wonderful experience. And uh, he was a traditional um, Raja Yogan. And uh, the, the methods he taught were uh, the meditation was a traditional mantra meditation. Uh, which that I still do today. I mean, I'm still doing that 40 years later. So that was uh, sort of my spiritual path. In the meantime, I became more and more interested in transpersonal psychology and acquired more and more friends in the Bay Area where, you know, I was in Missouri for a few years and I belonged to the Association for Transpersonal Psychology. This was in the 70s. And I was the only member in Missouri. So uh, California was the place to go. And I worked, uh, worked part-time for um, Sabra for many years uh, through uh, much of the 80s uh, and acquired many friends and eventually was offered a full-time job at CIIS, California Student Integral Studies, uh, where I still work full-time, although I'm planning on retiring in the near future. But since everything's online, I can do it from Ecuador. So that was then the genesis of uh, the Society for Consciousness Studies too, the CIIS? Uh, yes, uh, sort of. Uh, it's a complex story, but basically I was the director, uh, I still am, I guess, of the Center for Consciousness Studies. Um, and we were building there, although the the school really has taken something of a curve uh, after the last president, Joe Subiando, left. Um, there's still a lot of consciousness stuff there. 
courses and so on that touch on consciousness studies. But the drift over the last few years has been towards uh, more social kinds of issues, I would say post-Marxist actually, neo-Marxist. Uh, and uh, what I had started there was really not growing. And so I was very frustrated in some ways. And so I started the Society for Consciousness Studies really as a, uh, as a Google group. <laughs> Just uh, started uh, contacting friends and forming a group. I think there were about 12 or 15 of us at first. Uh, and it just grew from there. So, so last year I was at your conference at Yale and there was a eclectic group of philosophers, scientists, neuroscientists, quantum physicists. Um, in hindsight, I see that uh, this organization has actually evolved to really come at the intersection of science, spirituality, and social studies as well. Where would you say we are now in our deeper understanding of consciousness, the heart problem of consciousness, neuroscience? Where do you think we are? And what is your take on consciousness? Is it uh, a brain activity or is the brain also an experience in consciousness? <laughs> Where is consciousness? Uh, yeah, good question. Well, consciousness is everywhere, of course, and not only in a kind of metaphysical sense, but uh, uh, it permeates so many different disciplines. We have people in philosophy, we have people in biology, brain science, we have psychologists, we have anthropologists, we have, you know, uh, there is an aspect of consciousness studies in so many different disciplines. And what the, ironically, what this is, means in some ways is that we don't really have departments of consciousness because it's sort of like what I would say is sort of like mathematics, but we do have departments of mathematics. But I mean, it's just, it's becoming, uh, it's infusing so many different disciplines. And <clears throat> I don't know quite what to say about progress. More and more people are studying. Uh, they're doing great work. Of course, there's a whole area of quantum physics and what's going on there in relation to uh, consciousness and uh, philosophy moves along in its own sort of way. I think there's a real breakthrough taking place in thinking, not so much in academic philosophy departments, but as Michael Murphy, you know, co-founder of Eslon often says, uh, these uh, philosophy moves forward one funeral at a time. <laughs> referring to academics but uh, yeah what I'm seeing is the idea of uh, a post-physical or post-physicalism kind of study of consciousness it is really growing and it's not only growing one funeral at a time in academia but uh, you know, it's sort of like parapsychology. Even when I was a student in the 1960s, uh, I could go talk to a psychology professor and say, do you believe in any of these things, ESP or, you know, communication from the other side? Or anything? And they would say, well, yeah, I do. I've experienced some of this. But, you know, I can't dare talk about it. And... Uh, there's no place for it in the academy itself. Well, I think the uh, post-reductionist uh, worldview is sort of going through that transition. We're getting to the point now where more and more people are, are you might say, coming out. Uh, and they're saying, yeah, there's the, you know, I heard a long talk by uh, Kripal, what's his first name? that wrote the flip, uh, 
and uh, about he's uh, he's at uh, I'll come to me in a second, but uh, his point was that there are more and more folks in the academy uh, sort of breaking out of this this field. And it's getting harder and harder to maintain a traditional Newtonian uh, physicalist uh, Daniel Dennett worldview. It's like uh, Bertrand Russell said, I probably would be a materialist if there were any evidence for it. <laughs> okay, so where we are right now, last I looked in the science magazine, the 125 open questions in science. The first one was, what's the universe made of? And the uh, answer is we don't really know because 96% is dark energy, dark matter. Of the 4% that's atomic, 99.9% .9 or more is invisible interstellar dust. And then the rest of the universe, visible universe, which is 2 trillion galaxies, 700 sextillion stars and uncountable trillions of planets is apparently 0.01% of what exists, atomic visible universe. And right. if, if you look yeah. at the atomic universe, it ends up being waves and particles and ultimately nothing. So the only answer we can give to what's the universe made of at the moment is made of nothing. And the second open question in science, what's the biological basis of consciousness? And the answer to that seems to be that there is no biological basis of consciousness, that biology is an experience in consciousness. So yes, what I you're saying is very relevant to why this worldview is so crucial right now if you hope to create a more peaceful, uh, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. I think we have to go over the superstition of matter. You know, I keep asking scientists, has any scientist ever observed an entity that they can call matter or are they just interpreting their perceptual experiences which are species specific and actually a modified form of their own consciousness? So do you think this overthrow what could be the climactic overthrow of the superstition of matter could actually help us reach a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world because the underlying premise of the new paradigm is that uh, consciousness is one, its activities are many, many minds, many knowers, many modes of knowing, species and culture specific, many things known, but ultimate reality is one. And if we have that experience, we spontaneously transcend fears. We have the experience of uh, platonic values like truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity, even the loss of the fear of death because consciousness is not in time. So I'd like to ask you to re respond to this comment. <laughs> That's quite a long comment, Deepak. Uh, I don't know. My big worry is, can we hold the planet together long enough for all this to happen? <clears throat> but uh, certainly a lot of truth in it. Uh, actually, one of my own views is that, uh, and you kind of pointed to it, is that there's, um, we don't really understand the universe in any kind of ultimate sense, even if you're a physicist. Uh, we've got quantum theory and we've got uh, relativity that almost fit together, but not quite. But there are so many things that happen in this world that just don't fit. And, and this was Kripal's point. So many people have experiences of... Uh, experiences of people who have died that come back and talk to them in dreams or appear to them. Uh, another thing that's, and this is very weird, no, no into it too far, but uh, you know, we've got like, uh, if you've taken any interest in like UFOs, 
anybody that's really studied them, and there have been some very serious people, J. Allen Hynek at Ohio State, the head of the astronomy department, uh, really have come to the conclusion that they're not just, it's not a physical phenomenon in the normal sense that some spaceship like from Star Trek comes and visits the earth. I mean, these phenomena appear and disappear. There's an intelligence to them that we can't figure it out. Um, I think we forget that uh, even though we're making good progress with uh, quantum theory, and we're making good progress with relativity and all those things. They're just mathematical models. I mean, they're just mathematical <laughs> models that are working pretty well for us, but uh, you know, mathematics is something you can rearrange all kinds of different ways. And, and I have to believe based on so many phenomenon uh, out there, for example, last weekend, the uh, British uh, Society for Science and Medicine had a conference called uh, Beyond the Flatland in which they question how well we really understand the world, uh, you know, because there seem to be spiritual dimensions to the universe as well, and they're not recognized at all, even by the most liberal physicists, which, you know, doesn't mean they just, there are things that exist that we don't understand. <laughs> and where they are and how they are, we don't understand. So I wouldn't be surprised if our whole model of the physical universe is going to just implode one day if somebody's going to come up with a better one. Uh, in fact, people are coming up with alternatives and uh, they don't seem to be better. But I guess I didn't really answer your question. I think if uh, one of the points you make in your book, which is, is a, uh, a, a kind of riff, riff on what we're talking about is, uh, can you trust reality? Can you trust the life you live in, the experiential life you live in? Can you turn your destiny over to the cosmos? Okay, and if you do that, uh, things change. I think as you point out in the book, and things happen. Well, I mentioned Swami Rama, who was my great teacher earlier. And I remember somebody asking once, why are all these synchronicities popping around you all the time? Things just work out. And he said, well, it is the, uh, it is a cooperation of the of destiny of the uh, providence is what he said, and uh, I, I've found that to be true of people who are deeply spiritual, and and in my own life, if you just trust what's going on, uh, things open up, opportunities open up. I mean, there's a lot of people talked about this. Orbendo talked about it. The mother talked about it. When you find your spiritual path, things will come to you. Books will come to you. Friends will come to you. Teachers will come to you. And, um, you know, I wrote a whole book on synchronicity. And uh, one of the chapters is about manifestation. So I'm not what you would call a new age person that goes around manifesting things all the time. But my experience is that if I trust in my own destiny and follow it, trust in my own life, uh, it opens up, things open up for me. And uh, difficulties get resolved if you can rest with them and sit with them, see where they're leading. So I hope we can do this on a larger scale. So uh, let me ask you, uh, have you experienced uh, what anybody might call extrasensory perception anytime in your life? Only a few times. But you have, right? I have. In, in my case, uh, it was physical. I see. But when I, when I was near people, I could sense their emotions. Uh -huh. Now, this was in a very unusual time for me. Uh, I had just finished my dissertation. 
I was in an unhappy marriage and my wife went on a trip. <laughs> uh, and I just was elated. And I suddenly think just, it was like my spirit went straight up. And I started noticing uh, people around me that, uh, and I could feel their, their emotion. And one of the interesting things about this is uh, I'm also a kind of a Jungian, poor man's Jungian, I guess, is that they say uh, that the miraculous comes to you through your weakest side through the undeveloped. And for me, the intellectual side and the intuitive side, and even the, well, the, the physical side and the feeling side were clearly my undeveloped sides. And that's where I was, that's where I was sensing it. But, you know, I have to do a lot of things I have. I've never seen a flying saucer, for example. And uh, I tell you the truth, I think telepathy happens all the time. Have you, have you seen a flying saucer? No, that's my point. No, yeah. My point is I, I don't need to see these things. In the right. you know, people are not lying to me. But uh, I do think we, we have uh, what I would call telepathic experiences. So commonly we don't even think about them. I mean, you and I are talking here. Um, I sit with my wife in the morning and drink coffee. I start to say something, she finishes. You know, we've just grown used to that, that we have kind of come together. And uh, uh, so I think a lot of what you might call telepathic experience. Well, you know, as I look across the landscape of the literature now, both in science and paranormal studies or so-called paranormal studies, I'm seeing more and more reports of precognition, memories of other lifetimes, after death experiences, out of body experiences, spontaneous remissions, healing. I mean, the literature is coming so rapidly. If you do a meta survey, it seems that almost everyone at some point uh, has the experience of some dormant potential that they had that they didn't know of. And the essential religious experience always has been three things, transcendence, um, the emergence of what we call platonic values and the loss of the fear of death. So I think nothing could be more important. If you had that experience, it would unleash what you uh, we started with, you know, the human potential movement started in the 60s. Uh, right. It never disappeared, by the way. It just is, is coming to a new flowering at the moment. Right. Yes, indeed. And, and you have been a pioneer in this field. So I, I want to express Thank my you. gratitude to you. Also want to tell you that I'm very honored to speak to you. And if you feel it's valuable, we should collaborate on some of the projects or ideas that CIIS has and the Institute of Consciousness Studies. There's a lot to explore. And I'll be in touch with you on all those fronts. I would love to do that. And in the meanwhile, we should call this talk today. Here's the title. Uh, Carolyn, are you ready?